Well, it seems that what everybody is talking about in the sports world, that national semifinal between Iowa and UConn from Cleveland, great atmosphere, but controversy. Iowa winning the game, but some people saying, hey, maybe UConn got robbed of an opportunity here. Ooh, who knows? But I'll tell you how I break it down from that controversial play. All right, so there were multiple angles that we were able to see. And one angle I thought showed it clear as day. Edwards was moving to her left when contact was made. Her forearm was slightly up. Not all the way up, but slightly up. She is a taller player. And in my view, this did displace Marshall, who was trying to continue over the screen and her defensive assignment versus Beckers. So for me, this was correctly called as a moving screen. I realize there are a number of people who do not agree with that. Oh, and I also understand that we see Gabby Marshall sort of flying back, flinging back in this sort of fashion, which does not necessarily give the public confidence that this was a legitimate foul because it seems that so many players are doing that these days, trying to attract the attention of an official, get that whistle to blow, and then everybody just sort of chalks it up to, oh, you know, they're selling the call. But to me, in watching this specific situation, I don't even think that there was any selling going on. It seemed to me that it was legitimate that Marshall was knocked off her path on this play. That's what I saw. Now, for anybody who is so inclined, you can look through the entire game footage and try to find whether there were other similar instances which could have been a moving screen that were missed. Hey, point them out if you can find them. But for me, that still would not change what happened in that specific moment. I have zero doubt that if this call had been made in the first quarter, second quarter, third, or even early in the fourth, this would not have been controversial at all. But as we know, it was made with roughly five seconds left. The team with the ball, that being UConn trailing by a point, and here we are. It's controversial. No question that if you are a college basketball fan or certainly a UConn fan, you wanted to see it just play out. You know, you hear the whole, let the players play. Because who knows what would have happened had a shot gone up. Maybe they missed it, but maybe they make it. We'll never know. There's also a really tough reality here, as I see it at least that I'm sure really occurs to lots of UConn fans. And that is, had the game official just passed on making that call, there wouldn't have been any uproar. There wouldn't have been this huge firestorm. Maybe a few would have tried to point something out, but very unlikely that it would have gained any traction. I think most people wouldn't even have noticed that it had happened. But that game official noticed that it happened. And when you see something happen, it is your obligation, it is your duty to step up and make that call. If it is a foul in the first five seconds of the game, it's a foul in the final five seconds of the game. We should not insist that our game officials just swallow their whistle simply because we are reaching the climax of an important contest. For the integrity of the game, You've got to make the call if that's how you see it. And that's what was done in this situation. And I happen to be someone who believes that the right call was made. This is nothing against Aaliyah Edwards as a player. She is a tremendous player. And I think overall did a strong job in this game. Lots of plays come to mind, particularly that steal that she had, I think it was in the second quarter, which led to the open layup for her. Oh, she... <laughs> UConn is not in this situation without Edwards. No question about it. Obviously, Paige Beckers, who missed all of last season, we see the type of impact she has when she's actually able to play. And she returns to the team that suddenly has to deal with all these injuries. I mean, this is an injury-riddled team. They're down five players. 
including a couple of starters that we know from early in the year, they were done very early in the season. I think AZ Fudd what, got in two games. Caroline Descharm, I think four games. So UConn continued to battle, love the way that K.K. Arnold, the freshman, stepped up. Ashlyn Shade, she obviously did a lot of things for UConn this season. Ice Brady as well. I mean, on down, down the line. Heck of a job by Gino Ariema. This was one of his best coaching jobs, for sure, with all the things that they had to overcome. But Iowa had to overcome some things as well. The Hawkeyes, they're down to starter also. As we know, Molly Davis has not played since the regular season finale at home versus Ohio State. So she has not logged any postseason minutes at all this year, including the Big Ten tournament and here in the NCAA tournament. And it's remarkable that there is a chance that Davis could resurface in the championship game versus South Carolina. We don't know for sure, but there is that chance. She's been working very hard to try to get back onto the floor. But nonetheless, Iowa has had to make some adjustments without the services of Davis, and they've done a tremendous job. Great work here by Lisa Bluter and the entire coaching staff, and give credit to the players as well for what they've been able to do. And keep in mind, Iowa also had to overcome a 12-point deficit in this game versus UConn, and they did so. They also had to overcome what I thought was a great defensive strategy by the Huskies, led by Nika Mule, whose one-on-one play on Clark was perhaps as good as we've ever seen against Clark in her college career. Nika Mule deserves a lot of credit for what she did in that game. Great work! But the Iowa Hawkeyes, they legitimately got the dub. And as we know, even after that controversial call, UConn still had a chance. Clark got fouled, made the first free throw, putting Iowa up by two. But then she missed the second free throw. A chance there for UConn to get to the rebound. But what happens? Sydney of Falter, as she has done so many situations, comes up with the offensive rebound. And that pretty much sunk the Huskies right then and there. So now we'll see what happens in the title game. This should be a tremendous matchup. We know that South Carolina, an undefeated basketball team, they are tough. But anybody can be beat. Their head coach certainly understands that. Dodds Taley knows the deal. Last year, South Carolina certainly was favored versus Iowa in the semifinals. And Iowa pulled it off. Can the Hawkeyes do it again? Sure they can. But it's going to be, they're going to have to play their best game in order to do so. And Camilla Cardoso, six foot seven, a matchup nightmare for just about every team. But I'll say this the way that Hannah Stolke played in the semifinal versus UConn, that has to give Iowa some confidence that they can neutralize the great Cardoso. But you got to deal with their other players as well. Raven Johnson. Tremendous talent. Tessa Johnson. Tahina Pow Pow. Ashlyn Watkins. Oh, my goodness. Chloe Kitts, starter on this team for sure. And then off the bench, Mylasia Fuwali, the freshman. She is dynamic. She is exciting. She has to be dealt with. She's really their number two scorer. She's coming off the bench. So looking forward to this matchup. We'll see how it plays out. Iowa versus South Carolina from Cleveland for the national championship.